Hey everyone, I'm Nick from Coffee Before Arch, and in this episode of Computer Organization Design, uh, we're going to continue talking about uh, computer architecture, and this time, moving on from talking about the power wall last time, uh, we're going to be talking about, you know, kind of the ways that computer architecture was influenced because of this uh, limitation on transistor scaling, uh, and this limitations on power, uh, and being able to push frequencies uh, even further while decreasing voltages. Right, so we saw that, um, that you know, picture in the past of how we can't really scale frequency anymore. But probably the better thing to look at is um, this growth in processor performance since about the, the mid 80s, right? So it goes back to 1976. Uh, but, you know, really where this performance trend was very apparent started around 1986, right? And so you see for, you know, roughly 20 years or so from 1986 until very early 2000s, 2003 or so, we had this great period of around 52% uh, performance increase per year, right? And so you see that, you know, as we mentioned last time, uh, since around 2004 or so, where, where you know, transistor scaling became more difficult, um, we hit the power wall, etc. Uh, we've entered this region where we're getting only about 22% performance uh, improvement per year, right? And so, you know, what are we measuring performance on? So this is on the uh, spec uh, int benchmarks, right? So we might talk about benchmark suites uh, later. Uh, so, you know, what we're really seeing is that, you know, you know, during this period of around 20 years, we mined out a lot of the different uh, optimizations that we could do. So things like branch prediction, we got really, really good at. Things like mining out instruction level parallelism, we got really, really good at. So it's a combination of the fact that, you know, the technology scaling isn't improving quite as fast and the field is becoming more and more mature where it's becoming more difficult to improve on these architectures that have been iterated on for generations. So uh, one way that we've uh, been using to combat this fact that, you know, it's, it's really hard to improve single threaded performance is instead moving to, uh, you, moving to multiple cores, right? So, um, when we're talking about trying to decrease response time, this is how fast a single core um, is going to be running. So, you know, instead of focusing on just running a single process now, now we can start tackling the larger problem of, you know, well, what if we want to do multiple things in parallel, right? So uh, we generally call these uh, processors with multiple cores. These are going to be called microprocessors. Um, so something like a quad core microprocessor is a chip that has four processors or four cores, right? And so modern chips have many more cores than this, especially with uh, very large server chips that'll have, you know, upwards of 32 cores uh, on a single chip. So now, you know, pro let, let's talk about, let's talk about what really matters here. So who uses the processors? And fundamentally, this is programmers, right? So programmers write the software that's going to run on the processors. And, you know, one thing that that region from 1986 to around 2003, 2004, uh, that was really nice was that, you know, programs would just run better on new architectures. Uh, and the problem with decreasing single threaded performance is that um, those same programs aren't going to be running, you know, faster and faster and faster, at least at the same pace as they used to. Um, so programmers can't expect as much free um, improvement just by increases in, say, clock frequency, right? So you know, what they basically got with this, you know, every 18 months without having to change a line of code, uh, they got double the performance. So, so what do we do now? So what do we do now that we, we're not going to get this, you know, doubling of performance for free, you know, every 18 months or so. So now we've th we have to start thinking of, you know, instead of using, you know, faster single threaded performance, how do we use uh, this idea that we have multiple cores now and start talking about parallelism and parallel programming? Right, so that that's really one of the key things here, uh, but this isn't as easy as it sounds, right? So, the big question on everyone's mind is why has it been so hard for programmers to write explicitly parallel programs, right? And the first um, the first reason that parallel programming is by definition uh, performance programming, which increases the difficulty of said programming, uh, and the reason why is because a lot of times when we're trying to do performance programming, what the programmer has to understand now is exactly how their code is interacting with the underlying hardware, right? And this can be very difficult, especially because hardware vendors don't typically tell you what they're doing underneath, um, or they, they, they generally kind of obfuscate uh, what's going on in the underlying hardware, 
right? But fundamentally, you need some of that information and, you know, how you get that information can either be through, you know, micro benchmarking to try to, you know, explicitly figure out what a specific part of a processor is doing. Um, and it's a lot, it's a very time intensive iterative process just to, you know, optimize certain parts of the program. You know, normally what an application developer would like to do is, you know, to kind of be hands off and to, you know, just think about things in terms of the software la layer and not have to think about things in terms of um, the hardware layer. So, you know, that's going back to this idea of having different abstractions. Now, the other thing, despite, uh, despite the fact that you have to, you know, understand some more about the underlying hardware, is that parallel programming fundamentally is just much more difficult than sequential programming, right? So what we really want to do with parallel applications is, you know, divide work evenly so that every single processor has roughly the same amount of work to do at the same time, right? So if we're not balancing our processor uh, properly, we're not going to see much of an improvement, right? It'll basically just be like we're running a single threaded code just on multiple different cores. So, you know, they use this idea of a newspaper in the book. And so say you've got eight reporters working on the same story, you could potentially write a story eight times as fast. Right, so this is usually the ideal case with parallel programming where you say, I have eight cores, I could theoretically do some program eight times as fast. But there's a lot of things that go into this. So, um, so to achieve this increased speed in this example, you would need to, of course, break up the tasks uh, so that each reporter has something to do. Generally, we call this decomposition. Right, and then we must uh, schedule the subtasks um, right, so we have to, after we break up our tasks into subtasks, we've got to say, you know, this is what everybody's going to do. Then, uh, but we also, what we also have to do is we have to, you know, map this onto, you know, how are these different, uh, these different tasks, right? And these different, you know, people that are going to be doing these different subtasks, how are these, you know, people going to communicate with each other? So it's very unlikely that in every single application, all the subtasks will be 100% independent of each other and they can all run without talking with each other. In real applications, there's going to be some communication. And a lot of times, um, what these uh, what these applications are bottlenecked on, especially once you st start getting to giant data uh, database and uh, uh, supercomputer level you know, software or even data center le level software, it turns out that this uh, things like communication and synchronization overheads when you've got massive distributed systems, these tend to start outweighing some of the bottlenecks that you know you think are the most important when it comes to you know normal single threaded code. Right. And so, you know, as you can kind of see here, even with this simple example, and even things like, you know, uh, there, there's spe specific things that you can't possibly get around. So in this example of having eight, you know, reporters all you know working on the same story, you can't write the conclusion for the story before you know the entire body of the story is written. So fundamentally, you know that thing can't be done in parallel with the others, um, and that's what really makes you know, despite the fact that you know we've got you know multi-core and theoretically we could have things eight times as fast, uh, the software often doesn't map um, directly to the processors in such an easy fashion. So that's really kind of you know the landscape and where a lot of computer architecture has moved. Uh, this isn't to say that single-threaded performance isn't important. Single-threaded performance is still massively important, but a lot of uh, work that goes on nowadays uh, deals with effectively using these massive multi-core processors that we have. Now, in the remaining of this series, we're going to be talking about you know parallelism and instructions, uh, you know parallelism and computer arithmetic. So this is more talking about you know what do uh, computers do as far as you know the actual calculations they perform with the instructions um, and then we you know talk about things like pipelining and using things like branch prediction in order to Im improve our pipelines uh, one of the most important things we'll talk about starting in chapter five is the actual memory hierarchy itself so of course we you know, we, we want to interact with memory but it turns out that the memory system can be rather rather tricky to work with Right. And then uh, through some of the other appendices, we'll go into, you know, some more contemporary issues, including, you know, heterogeneous architectures. So your CPUs interacting with things like accelerators, like GPUs, right, which are commonly used for graphics. But, you know, more recently in the past 10 years or so, they've they've taken a pretty strong market uh, in terms of uh, 
you know, general purpose programming, right? It's leading to this idea of GPGPU or general purpose graphics processor units. Uh, but that's going to do it uh, for this episode. Uh, next time, we'll go ahead and look at this benchmarking of the Intel Core i7 processor to get a better idea of how, you know, benchmarking of, you know, an actual processor would go about. Uh, feel free to check out any of the other code for any of these series at github.com slash coffee before arch. So if we go ahead and go to the repositories, we've got stuff on, uh, you know, GPU programming with CUDA, C++ programming, uh, even Python programming. So if we take a look at, say, C++ data structures, you know, if you ever wanted to learn how Quicksort works, we've got a video link and a link to the actual code right there. But that's going to do it for today. I'm Nick from Coffee Porch, and I hope you have a nice day.